present some historical context and uh, information about the Godbeites today. So Lyman was very active in the Godbeites. He spent uh, the several years actively touring Utah, preaching in favor of them, and was ultimately made the president of the Godbeite Church of Zion. The movement was never incredibly successful. No more than two to three hundred adherents ever joined it, and after a few years, it kind of pittered out. Um, the Godbeite uh, uh, schism, rebellion, whatever you want to call it, the church, it began primarily as a rebellion against Brigham Young's social and political um, activities and uh, advocacies. What they were really rebelling against was they were rebelling against Young's longtime ideas of an independent kingdom of God. There had been this long-standing dream that originated with Joseph Smith. It was continued on by Brigham Young, and Amos Lyman was right there with it, supporting it all along the way. And this dream was that the Mormons could go somewhere in the West and be completely independent. They could have their own independent government. They could be economically independent. They could have their own society uh, completely independent and separate from the rest of the world. And you see these themes continually um, recirculating in Utah, especially in economic matters. As soon as Brigham Young and the Saints get to the Salt Lake Valley, Brigham Young begins lecturing everyone saying, all right, now's the time, it's time for us to be economically independent. So how many of you would like to start making your own clothes? And they'd go through and they'd try to produce home manufacturers, the idea that we won't send money back east to, for, to just enrich shopkeepers, merchants, and manufacturers. We want to keep that money here and keep all of this, uh, our economic interests local. This was especially true in the 1860s, in the years leading up to the Godbeite movement. In the wake of the Transcontinental Railroad, Brigham Young feared that uh, the real isolation of the saints was coming to an end and wanted to try and uh, hedge up this independent kingdom of God idea. And so he began touring through Utah, establishing united orders, encouraging communities to live the law of consecration, and began issuing boycotts against uh, non-Mormon merchants and shopkeepers in Salt Lake City. The Godbeites, many of whom were uh, fellow shopkeepers, uh, bristled under this, and they wanted to try and integrate Mormon Utah politically and economically into the broader nation. They said, this is kind of ridiculous that we're trying to do our own thing. We need to be part of the national economy. We need to be part of the national political conversation and not just as the butt of jokes or the target of anti-Mormon political campaigns. We want to be part of the broader American um, uh, system. And on this point, I think history has to judge that the Godbeites were right. By the 1890s, everything that they had fought for, even though the Godbeite movement was not around to uh, celebrate this, everything they called for in the 1890s came to pass. The Council of 50, which really more than anything else represented the independent political kingdom of God, a secret uh, theocratic governing uh, body, it stopped meeting in the 1880s, and it had only occasionally met before that. You look at economics, and this is even more true. By the 1890s, Wilfred Woodruff, who we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, he'll be mentioned several times here. By the 1890s, Wilfred Woodruff re realized our home manufacturer, our United Orders, aren't really cutting it. We need to try and integrate into the national economy. And so instead of saying, let's start producing all of our own clothes, they tried to figure out what, what cash crop can we in Utah grow and manufacture that we can integrate into broader national markets. And their decision was sugar beets. And so the church founded the Utah-Idaho Sugar Company and became part of this broader economic system. So when we talk about the social ideas that Amos Lyman advocated in the later years of his life, um, where we talk about um, integration into the political system, again, Wilfred Woodruff in the 1890s as part of statehood, um, although the stories of general authorities coming to wards and dividing them down the middle between Republicans and Democrats are probably exaggerated, it is true that in the 1890s, Wilfred Woodruff said, all right, we need to disband our church political party, the People's Party of Utah, and we want all of you to search out the two national major parties, Republicans and Democrats, 
and uh, we want you to figure out which one best represents your conscience and join those parties. So by the 1890s, politically and economically, the Godbeites and Amos Lyman had been proven right. Now, of course, the Godbeite movement was not just a social and economic uh, rebellion against Brigham Young's leadership. They did have unique, unorthodox uh, spiritual beliefs, and so let's, let's talk a little bit about those. And to do this, I want to provide a little background historical context on Mormon theology. Now, one of the most difficult things to define is just what do exactly do Mormons believe? And this is something that church leaders and church members have debated about and kind of fought over. We know the basics, the basics you can find in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, but what about the mysteries? You'll often carry, but what about some of these other ideas or theories? This has been a long-standing uh, challenge for church members and leaders. Part of the reason is Joseph Smith, especially in Nauvoo, um, liked to think on his feet. When you get really familiar with Joseph's sermons, um, and when you really work closely with him, you can tell that he's exploring a lot of ideas openly in, uh, or privately in group settings. And so he'll be exploring lots of ideas with lots of uh, different groups. And oftentimes, if you look especially at Nauvoo and the new the uh, theological teachings that are revealed to Joseph in Nauvoo, these are often done in secret and private uh, locations. And so, for example, Amos Lyman plays a huge role as Joseph Smith's counselor in what is colloquially known as the Quorum of the Anointed, this group that is... Uh, that has the temple ceremonies revealed to them before the Nauvoo temple is completed. Uh, this is a very small, select, private group, and they're, of course, being repeatedly instructed by Joseph about the temple and about other uh, matters of uh, church theology that are not being taught to everyone. And the same is true with the Council of Fifty I mentioned earlier, which Amasa is part of and uh, speaks his mind frequently in that uh, in that organization. Again, you have this private group that Joseph is teaching, uh, teaching in. And so in Nauvoo, we see Joseph start to teach things, uh, many of which we're familiar with, uh, baptisms for the dead, uh, temple ceilings, temple work, the endowment. Uh, you see him start to preach about the nature of man, the nature of God. You start to see him teach about um, uh, how we can better know the nature of God, and, try, and he starts teaching the idea that uh, man can internally progress and become like God. But these are often breadcrumbs that Joseph starts to preach about and then maybe lets alone. And so you have lots of different ideas in circulation. And as soon as Joseph dies, you have lots of people who want to just take all of these little breadcrumbs that Joseph left and try to take them in different locations. And Brigham Young then becomes the new arbiter, uh, arbitrator of what is Mormon doctrine. And he does this with three criteria. One, his memory. Does he remember Joseph teaching it? And if he remembers Joseph teaching it, then it's okay. If he remembers Joseph teaching the opposite, then it's bad. Two, revelation. Brigham Young was very insistent all the time that the Lord would guide him and tell him what was true. At the same time, Brigham Young also relied on his own beliefs and reasoning. And this is where um, the, the elephant in the room is, ironically, at this time when you have lots of different people teaching different things, Brigham Young is one of the most notorious for coming up with his own ideas of ways of making sense of the uh, Mormon cosmology and saying, aha, this is it. So for, uh, for example, in Brigham Young's own mind, as he studies the private teachings that Joseph has uh, given to the Quorum of the Anointed, he says, okay, I know Joseph taught about the eternal progression. I know Joseph Smith taught us about the temple. I've got it. Michael is the father, El uh, Jehovah is the grandfather, and Elohim is the great-grandfather. I figured it out, to which most other church members kind of bristled and said, I, I, I think you might be wrong on that one, Brigham. On other ones, Brigham Young had more success. For example, Orson Hyde, following some of uh, Miss following some of Joseph's uh, suggestions, start to teach that, aha, I figured it out. Our children are resurrected beings, and they've lived in past ages, and now they have been, uh, they're resurrected beings that have come to the earth to enjoy the gospel. Brigham Young says, no, that's nonsense. 
One of the more famous ones is Orson Pratt. Orson Pratt in this period starts to teach that, all right, we know that Joseph taught eternal progression. We know that he taught we can be exalted. Um, but at the same time, the Bible says there's only one God. So how do we reconcile this? Aha, I've got it. God isn't a person. God is a list of attributes. So anyone who takes upon themselves all of the attributes of God becomes like God. I figured it out. Brigham Young hammers this home. They have lots of fights about this in the Quorum of the Twelve. And finally, uh, Orson Pratt apologizes and, um, uh, and all the, everything's made right. I think that's where we need to, that, that's the context we need to think about when we talk about Amos Alimen's unique or unorthodox teachings later in his life. For Amos Alimen, which he, in his Dundee discourse and later on throughout his life in private sermons and local sermons and in his ministry in the Godbeite Church, Amos Alimen's beliefs in God were governed by really one principle. God's and Jesus' love was sufficient to save everyone. However, we are saved through Jesus' love, example, and teachings, not by his death or blood sacrifice. We become perfect by following Christ, not through Christ's, uh, not through Christ's uh, death. The Godbeites following Lyman embraced this kind of universalism, which argued that we'll all be saved, but we can be made perfect if we follow the attributes of Christ. Now, Brigham Young's ideas about Adam, Orson Pratt's ideas about God, less so Orson Hyde's ideas about babies being resurrected beings, um, but Amos Alimen's universalism, all of these ideas are in circulation and they cause all kinds of confusion. You can find many branches of the church in Utah where people are getting in fights and arguments over, well, I heard Brigham Young say this. Well, I heard Orson Pratt say this. Well, I heard so-and-so say this. And so there's all this confusion, especially about the idea of uh, what is the nature of God? What is the nature of the being of God? And finally, Wilford Woodruff, we're going to bring him up again, in 1895 has enough of it. And in general conference, proceeds to chastise the entire church and says, cease troubling yourselves about who God is, who Adam is, who Christ is, who Jehovah is. For heaven's sakes, let these things alone. Why trouble yourselves about these things? God has revealed himself. And when the 121st section of the Doctrine and Covenants is fulfilled, whether there be one God or many gods, they will be revealed to the children of men, as well as all the thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Then why trouble yourselves about these things? God is God, Christ is Christ, the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost. That should be enough for you and me to know. If you want to know anymore, wait until you get where God is and ask him. From this point on, the Wilfred Woodruff, George Q. Cannon, and others kind of embrace the idea of all of these ideas that we've been fighting over, that we've been arguing about for the last 50 years, don't really matter. God is God, Christ is Christ, and the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost. That should be enough. And so if you were to take this to the, the present, I think if we were to take, sit Amos Alignment down in a modern... Um, uh, Temple in recommend interview with a bishop. Now we have to be honest, Amasa would probably flunk out of the question, do you sustain your church leaders if it referred to Brigham Young? But otherwise, if you were to ask Amasa the question, do you have a testimony of the atonement of Jesus Christ? Amasa could simply and easily answer, yes, yes I do. Now, you don't have the bishop prying. Now, Amasa, can you tell me what do you think the blood of Christ does in the atonement? Can you tell me how you figure all of this out? That's not part of what makes you an Orthodox Mormon today. Your bishop doesn't ask you, how do you think the atonement works? Yes, you believe in God, but what, what do you think the nature of God and Jesus is? That, that's not part of it. So if we take that part of Amasa's spiritual legacy and beliefs, we can easily see or we can see that Amasa could very easily, his beliefs and his personality could very easily be tolerated, if not embraced, by the church by the 20th century. Now, of course, at the same time, uh, the 
Godbeite and, Lyme, and Amasa Lyman's universalism was not their only unorthodox teaching. And one that's a little bit harder to square uh, with LDS church doctrine and teachings is Lyman's embrace of spiritualism. Um, spiritualism grows up kind of tandem with Mormonism. It, it begins in upstate New York with young people who say that they can contact the spirits, two young sisters. And there's lots of varieties of spiritualism. You've got the people who conduct a seance, and then you have one of them kicking the table. Uh, a spirit. Um, but you have other forms that Amasa seem to really gravitate towards. These are especially kinds of uh, a belief that you have individuals who can, are really sensitive to, uh, spiritual, to spirits, to the, uh, the departed, and they can bring themselves into a trance, and the spirit of that individual can, of a deceased individual, can inhabit the body, and then they can automatically write a message from that deceased person. This seems to be really uh, something that Amos Alignment embraces. Um, he takes great comfort in his later years, from the 1860s through his death, takes great comfort at these messages that are produced in seances from his father, from his mother, from his grandparents. Uh, he receives a lot of these, supposedly, from Joseph Smith that he treasures. He treasures them so much, he takes to writing them down in his journal, where it's, you can tell it means so much to him to hear from his departed loved ones uh, that they love him, that they care for him, that they think he's doing the right thing. To receive a message from Joseph while Brigham Young is uh, excommunicating you, to receive a message from Joseph that says, you're on the right track, Amasa, I'd be doing the same thing. These me uh, spirit messages mean a lot to Amasa Lyman. Now, I think these are some of the harder things that, uh, to square, as I said, with uh, modern Latter-day Saint teaching. But I'm going to... Uh, offer at least a perspective on this. Starting in Nauvoo, Joseph Smith began to preach the idea that church members on earth today can help bring salvation uh, to their departed loved ones. And so you see this starting with the practice of baptisms for the dead in Nauvoo. It never really goes any further as far as temple work goes. By the time they get the Nauvoo Temple complete enough, not fully complete, but complete enough to do endowments, you already have threats that the federal government is going to burn down Nauvoo. The mob is coming, and so you can only run people through their own endowments and ceilings as fast as you can. There was almost no temple work for the dead done within the Nauvoo Temple aside from baptisms for the dead, which had been going on for some years. And the idea of temple ordinances redeeming the dead never really goes away uh, in the next several years of uh, next decades in Mormonism. But at the same time, you do not have a temple. And so it kind of goes to the background. The emphasis is build a temple. Build a temple so you can have these blessings. But without the ability to perform endowments and ceilings, they were still performing baptisms for the dead. But without those, um, the teachings of redemption of the dead kind of slid to the background. Um, and in place of it, you also had, um, in Nauvoo and later, the belief that, well, I can baptize my dead relatives, but that's the extent of it. If I want to be sealed to a, a righteous line, I need to be sealed to a member of the Twelve. I need to be sealed to Joseph. I need to be sealed to Brigham uh, as an adopted child. or as many people did, I want to be adopted to Amasa, as make Amasa my adopted father. Um, this idea that you had to be adopted to an already current uh, church leader was still prominent in Utah at the time that Amasa Lyman left the church. Um, this changes with the completion of the St. George Temple. Wilford Woodruff, again, um, begins to re-emphasize uh, temple work and the salvation of the dead. And in fact, as president of the church in 1894, Wilford Woodruff has a revelation and announces, I just received a revelation. We've been doing it all wrong. These, um, these adoptions that we've been doing, that's the wrong thing. 
we should be adopt we should be seeking out our dead relatives. We should be doing temple work for our dead relatives. We should be being sealed to our dead relatives. And so under Wilfred Woodruff, you see this re-emphasis on genealogy. You see this re-emphasis that had existed um, in Nauvoo on seeking out your dead. We know that this is something that Amasa cared a lot about then. In the Council of 50 Minutes, Amasa gives a discourse where he says, where he rejoices in the glory and power of the kingdom of God because it's a kingdom that can go all the way from the highest heavens to the prisons of the dead and offer salvation and uh, freedom to all in all of those realms. And I think by the 1890s, Mormonism as a whole starts to embrace this. You see the creation of the Genealogical Society of Utah. You see this embrace of genealogy um, in the late 19th century. And Amasa, I think, even sensed that something of this, like this was going to happen. In 1876, six years after his excommunication, while still very estranged from the church, he wrote to his son Lorenzo and, uh, uh, that, uh, about rumors that he was hearing about the completion, uh, nearing the completion of the St. George Temple. He wrote, we hear that President Young will start for the South tomorrow, the temple being so near completion as to be used for the purposes of its erection. Then, all underlined, he writes, the imprisoned in purgatory must feel a thrill, a thrill of joy in anticipation of their coming freedom. I think, uh, so while not excusing Amos Alignment spiritualism, I think, I hope this makes it a little bit more understanding where Amos Alignment embraced this very Mormon um, idea that we should seek after our dead at a time when it was not necessarily at the forefront of more, most people's thinking. Um, I'm out of time, but just to conclude, I just have two kind of historical takeaways. Um, and the first is, uh, to, to close the story, in 1909, or shortly before that, um, one of Amos's daughters reported uh, that Amasa had come to her in a dream and reported that he appeared in black clothing with a gulf separating them where he announced that he would he wanted to embrace her and was tired of uh, of his dark clothing and she related this to her her brother Francis Mary Lyman the Apostle um, Francis had been appealing to uh, church member church leaders for years to reinstate Amasa and finally arranged for Joseph F. Smith to sit down with his sister, hear the story, and upon hearing it, President Joseph F. Smith put his hand on Francis Marion Lyman and said, Well, Marion, I think your father suffered enough. Let's see what we can do for him. And then on Francis Marion Lyman's birthday in January 1909, Amos Lyman, or Francis Marion Lyman was rebaptized for his father, and Joseph F. Smith laid his hands on his head and restored all of the blessings and all of the um, uh, and everything that he had lost with his excommunication. Now, I think in giving this overview, I, I want to make two kind of concluding ideas or two concluding uh, uh, messages. One, I think the honest truth is um, Amos and Lyman ended up being right about a lot of things. And I hope what I with what I've shown you today is even when he was wrong. Maybe he wasn't as wrong as we sometimes think he was. And the final concluding thought I'd like to uh, offer along those lines is with Amos Lyman asking to be reinstated in 1909, he was being reinstated into a church that he would have felt much more comfortable belonging to in 1909 than he did the church he left in, 18, in the 1860s and 70s. Anyway, thank you.